Microsoft Build 2018 is coming to a close today. I'm going to go through all the big news with Zach Bowden. We'll tell you what's new and what's exciting. Yes, there really is some exciting stuff. Stay tuned. Okay, news item number one, your phone. So this was actually kind of, you know, a pretty big deal, I suppose. Now, OEM manufacturers have been putting these kind of apps on their devices for years, and I actually got to talk to Microsoft a little bit about this, but Zach, what do you think about this? Well, actually, why don't you explain what kind of your phone is or supposed to be? Yeah, so your phone is essentially bringing your phone to your PC. So Microsoft's whole idea right now is trying to make you use your phone less because it's distracting. And with your phone, it's an app that connects to your Android or iOS device and on Android at least allows you to reply to text messages, see entire text conversations, notifications and even photos. So somebody can send you a photo via a text message or even photos you've taken on your phone and uh, you know, use them on your on your PC, which is and, cool. and a lot of people have been asking about phone calls, which seems like an obvious thing too. And I can tell you today, kind of exclusively that phone calls is on their to-do list. Yes, they are gonna eventually do that specifically for Android, probably iOS too. Now iOS has some limitations. Yeah. You can't do iMessage through it because, well, Apple famously locks down their stuff. Now, there are workarounds that you can do if you want to kind of hack around this stuff and make it work, but Microsoft's not interested in doing that, they tell me. Instead, they do want to eventually meet with Apple and propose a partnership here and to do something along with bringing iMessage to this service. So that'll take a little while to get there. They do want to first get some feedback from users. We can expect this though to start landing with insider builds probably in the next few weeks, next few months. There's already a placeholder app in the yeah. store. So insiders on RS5, Redstone 5 will be getting this pretty soon. Obviously if you're on Android, you'll get the most benefits. You'll get the notifications, text messages and all that. I should also point out that you can create text messages with yes, this. Yes, you can create so, conversations and stuff. And also it's worth noting that this doesn't replace Skype SMS Relay, which yes. is something we learned today, which is very interesting because Skype SMS Relay is still Windows Phone exclusive. It's not on Android right. yet, which they said it was coming, but we haven't heard of that in a while, but we did get confirmed today that that is not replacing Skype SMS Relay. Your phone is a separate sort of thing which doesn't connect to the cloud or it doesn't store things in the cloud. And that's an important distinction yeah. here. One final bit about the services. This does not go through the cloud. It does use some abilities for syncing with your MSA, your Microsoft account, but otherwise what it's doing is forming a direct connection. It imports your information, but once that connection is severed, nothing is stored in the cloud. So there's no privacy violations or concerns here where SMS Relay is the opposite. It does get stored in the cloud. You do have to agree to that. So they're gonna avoid a lot of this new regulation stuff that's going on in the industry with privacy and security. And they're really at the forefront of that. So if you're worried about your data, don't hear. It should be very interesting. We'll have to see how yeah. this plays out in the coming weeks, but it sounds like a long-term project for them. I'm very excited to see it happening. We'll just have to see uh, Definitely. how it goes. Next up, we're talking about Timeline coming to iOS and Android. So if you're on Windows 10 Redstone 4, also known as the April 2018 update or build 1803, you may have Timeline enabled. And what that is, is the ability to see all your history across your devices, your browsing history, things you've been doing. And it also has search, which I actually find very useful. And what I really like about Timeline before we talk about the iOS and Android thing is, when Microsoft gets on stage and talks about edge computing, and they talk about the intelligent cloud, and it sounds like all this weird stuff, Timeline is that. The idea that it's taking all your history, putting it into the cloud, and then letting other devices see that, access it, making it searchable. Eventually, they also announced they're gonna put Cortana into there so that it can surface information. And this is important because on my Tuesday, I may have 140 instances of something in Timeline which is really not manageable. But if Cortana goes, here are the things that are important to you that you always tend to look at, instead of doing it a chronological, it's kind of a big deal. So that's an announcement build. This feature though, is coming to iOS and Android. Right, I mean, the implementations are quite interesting. On Android, it's coming to the Microsoft launcher, which is kind of where you would expect it to be. You swipe in to get that sort of, what's it called on the launcher where you swipe in from the left to get the all feed. Of your, the feed, yeah. it'll be in there. And there you can access things like your edge browsing history, Word, Word documents that you've opened in the past. I don't think it'll work with third party apps at first, but I, over time, I believe they will be adding that functionality. On iOS, they're adding it into the Edge app, which is where you will be able to see your browsing history. And I'm not sure if you'll be able to see your Word documents and stuff, but your browsing history is definitely a priority for them. Because right now, although the browsing history gets synced to the PC, it doesn't go both ways. You can't resume activities on your phone, but that is coming to iOS via the Edge app as well. 
And what's interesting I found out is you will be able to distinguish on your history where that came from. So yeah. if it came from your phone or your another PC, you'll be able to tell that. Now Microsoft has some challenges and things they need to figure out here, which is the timeline system is gonna be smaller on Android in the way that it's represented. So they're figuring out about, you know, what's called information density, how much stuff they should put in there. But I think this is actually a really big feature because this, for me, using it on PC has been a big deal. Specifically, I operate two or three PCs at a time, but I can go onto any one of them, search my history for an article I read three, four days ago, and it automatically brings it up. It's super cool. The idea that my phones, which now we don't have Windows Phone anymore, but Android or iOS being a part of that system as well, this is part of their broader vision of just making devices work seamlessly across the entire ecosystem. Yeah, and I think a lot more people will now find Timeline quite interesting and useful because not many people have multiple Windows 10 PCs, which right now is sort of the only way you can utilize Timeline in a usable manner. But now it's coming to iOS and Android, everybody has a smartphone, so now people can use that and take advantage of it as well. And there are more people with iPhones in a PC <laughs> than an iPhone in a Mac, so yeah. Um, yeah, this should be very exciting to see coming Definitely. over the next few weeks. Next up, Project Connect for Azure. So Connect is back, yeah, kind of. Surprise, it was dead, but now it's not. <laughs> so this is just another example of them taking a technology that was for Xbox and putting it out there for developers to do more work. Now we've seen Connect go to developers before. There was even an ability to connect it to a Windows 10 PC, but it was still a giant sensor yeah. and now it's tiny, right? Yeah, it's really small and they even confirmed at Build that they will be using this sensor in the next HoloLens. So that is sort of says in itself that this is a tiny sensor. I think they even released a picture of it. It's very small. Yeah, and we kind of expect that with iOS, of course, the iPhone 10 has basically what is the Kinect sensor in it. Yeah. And so it goes to show you how far our technology has come along. Now, what can we expect for consumers in this regard? I mean, we're not gonna expect a new Kinect you buy for your Xbox, although, in theory, I imagine a third-party company could now do something if they wanted yeah. to, if um, we don't know the full ramifications and of this. Even SDK. then, the, the sensor's small enough now that they could really put it in the console itself if they really wanted to for the next right. Xbox or whatever. And we may see other third-party IoT-type devices coming out. Um, smart. My big thing, I guess, is smart cameras in the home. Right now, they're not even smart cameras. They're only smart in the sense that they detect motion and they connect to the internet, but what we need to see is facial recognition, identification, and more of this kind of technology. And I think this is kind of the way in there. It's a weird one. We'll have to wait and see how this pans out though. But yes, uh, Connect is back, kind of. All right, real quickly, I just want to talk about Microsoft Launcher for Enterprise. So this kind of came out there and there's a lot of confusion about what it is and we found out more information. So this is <laughs> Microsoft Launcher for Enterprise. <laughs> now what, what it is though, it's this idea that when you go work for a company and they give you a phone or they have very tight restrictions about what that phone can do and access. And this allows them to deploy across devices. So if they have a fleet of devices using Intune management, which is their system for remote management, they could put this launcher in there, pre-bundled with some apps, some configurations, and they can send it out there for users. Also restrict access to things. So this is all super important to enterprise. Not very exciting for consumers, but it's a big deal for Microsoft because if they can now get their launcher onto devices for enterprise and get that out there and still ties into Office and Microsoft 365 and to Skype and OneDrive and all those services, well, that's gonna be good for them. It's a pseudo Windows phone in some way and it's kind of an interesting play, but we can expect that coming out over the next few months as well. But for the most part, it's basically the same launcher we all know just has Intune management built into it. And it's also worth noting as well that the Microsoft launcher is actually rather popular on Android. It's not like a side project still for Microsoft. It has over 10 million downloads on the Play Store and a 4.6 rating on the on the Play Store itself. So people are enjoying and using the Microsoft launcher. It's not like a sort of small thing that nobody's paying attention to. People are using it. Yep. Now another big announcement at Build was accessibility. So this is a super important issue to a lot of people at Microsoft. And it really is interesting to see how the company has evolved on this. So for people with disabilities who were essentially left out of technology or were rather a footnote to technology, right? A company had to, oh, okay, for blind people, we'll have to check a box, make sure they can kind of use it. But Microsoft's doing something different, which is building technology around the idea that, no, these people matter and we should actually cater to them. And what I think this is really interesting is because normal people, normies, also benefit a lot from this technology. So if they work on things like improving vision for users or improving audio or speech translation stuff, eventually this works into regular consumer products too that 
for cameras and for face recognition and audio. So all this research into AI and everything is, I think, a really big deal that for regular consumers who might not see the importance of this, you know, it's easy to, to dismiss, but I think that's probably the wrong way that we should look at this. They are also allocating a lot of money, at least $25 million towards companies that research in this area. And it's a big step in the right direction. It not only looks good, but it'll benefit all consumers as well. Next up, let's talk about some of my favorite stuff in Windows, Fluent Design. So Fluent Design, as we already know, is an evolving system. Microsoft announced it last year at Build 2017. And this year they're adding to it by evolving it and adding a few new things, elements and designs. They're also changing up a couple of things as well. So for developers specifically, the things like, things like the back button are changing. So right now in, in apps, the back button is in the title bar. That's changing. No longer is that a thing. Developers should no longer use that. Instead, Microsoft is encouraging developers to use a sort of unified design within the app. And Microsoft are promising or trying to promise consistent back buttons across apps, which is very exciting, <laughs> at least for people who enjoy UI like me. Also, there's other things like Fluent Design context menus that are in the work and all sorts of minor improvements to Fluent Design. Uh, we've already seen a lot of that implemented in the Redstone 4 uh, April 2018 release. Uh, and with Redstone 5 and beyond, they're going to continue adding Fluent Design. So this isn't just a a one-time thing. They are going to continue investing in Fluent Design across all of their products and hardware, so that's very exciting. Yeah, and this reminds me a lot in Twitter because Twitter, you do see the double back button. Yeah, it's kind of an eyesore. Buttons, yeah. yeah, so that's definitely being addressed. In fact, there's a ton of work being done here with progressive web apps. Mm -hmm. Uh, you learned actually about the Twitter, the original UWP, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Why don't you tell us what you learned? So there was a session there where they talked a little bit about bringing their PWA to the Windows Store and bringing it to Windows 10. And that was very interesting. They talked about how they are looking into bringing things like timeline support and dark mode to the Twitter PWA because it is possible to do that via the Windows 10 APIs, which is very nice. And they also mentioned things like how they know that their users don't really care if an app is native or UWP unless you're in the tech bubble. They did actually mention the tech bubble and how people who are listening to that session and people who probably watching this video, understand and realize that, hey, a PWA may not be as good as a native, but for most people, it's fine. Like They don't really care. They just care about a good user experience. And Twitter says they can bring a good user experience to Windows 10 via PWA. And that's very exciting. They also mentioned that over 70% of people who use Twitter on Windows use it on the desktop, which is a pretty interesting stat. And also not very surprising because, you know, Windows Phone doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Which also mentioned that dark mode will be coming, well, we don't have the exact ETA, yeah. but it is being worked on, and it's gonna be tied to the system yeah. element. So if you set dark mode in the system, it too will be dark, so it won't even be its own unique setting, which should be really clever. A uh, lot of work to come to the Twitter PWA, but it sounds like they got it kind of all figured out. Yeah, I mean, it's way better than the UWP. And they, also, they actually did say as well that they didn't actually have a developer team in-house when they were developing their UWP app, but they do for the PWA, which is why we're seeing so many updates. We've seen more than, yeah. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure there's more than the UWP got all together. And that's, that's really impressive. It's, it's good to see Twitter committed to their PWA on Windows 10. All right, some odds and ends. So we had John Friedman there, who is one of their head designers. He gave a presentation that was very entertaining, but also informative. So he has the unfortunate distinction of uh, leading design on four out of five failed products for Microsoft, including Kin, Courier, uh, there was Spot, the smartwatch, and oh, he was also involved the so UMPC, the Ultra Mobile Yeah, the PC. Ultra, yeah. And yeah. also, I didn't even know those smartwatches were a thing. I, spot watch, just because you're head. younger than me. Yeah. I remember Spot. <laughs> anyway, he got on stage, he actually showed a picture of some of the concept of Courier. That is the foldable device that was famously canceled, or at least announced to be canceled in 2010. And ever since then, we've been hearing, well, rumors of foldable devices have only really come out in the last seven months, along with Project Andromeda. Surprisingly, I don't think he has any part in any Andromeda stuff as he now works on Office and working to make that a more interesting experience. We didn't actually learn that much new about Curry, but he did confirm what we already kind of expected, which was specifically why it was canceled. You yeah, um, it was canceled basically because Microsoft wanted to invest in Windows 8 and that development platform with Metro apps. And the Courier ran a modified version of Windows that wasn't Windows 8. And at the time, Steven Sinofsky was very adamant that all, all of their current sort of OS efforts right now were Windows 8 based, which Windows 8, Windows Phone 8. Uh, so the Courier sort of didn't fit in that vision and it didn't have a, 
a sort of clean or clear developer story for Microsoft. So um, it sort of fell into an odd, it was timing pretty much, timing was bad as they were sort of moving to Metro and Windows 8. So they just pulled the plug, unfortunately. Yeah, it reminds me of Kin, which he was also involved yeah. with. Uh, that was canceled apparently in the same week as Courier yeah, 2. Yeah, it must have been a bad week for him. Yeah, and so Kin had the same problem where it existed in a world where Windows Mobile existed. But there was no development platform for it. So yeah. what we mean specifically is if Courier had come out, there'd be no apps for it. You could have just run Windows apps on it. In fact, there was no mail client for Courier. And don't forget, this wasn't a phone. This was just a straight up PC. So they would have had to do a lot of custom apps for it. And that is a big risk, especially when you're trying to put everything to a concerted effort with Windows. And we remember how the Kin story went down with Windows Phone. It came out and Kin was cool. But it was also like, but there was Windows Phone at the same time, yeah. and that people were like, why are you doing both? And that problem existed with Courier as well. Should also mention that they did point out, Kin is kind of the first example of cloud computing, where a lot of this stuff was stored in the cloud, you can log in with an account, pull it on your information, and that seems very common today, but back then that was a very innovative thing. So no, uh, no details about anything with Andromeda, but it was sort of a sneak peek behind the scenes and how they develop products. Okay, that wraps it up for this video. Now, I know not always the most exciting news for Microsoft, but still lots of big stuff. A lot of more news we didn't cover, including stuff for developers. If you want that information, head to Windows Central. I'd like to thank Zach Bowden for joining us and giving us his insight. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. As always, take care, buddy.